All right. Welcome back to another episode of the Show Me the Data podcast. Today, we have Julia from PubNub. Julia, thanks for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to be here. Cool. So today, and just for context, Julia recently joined PubNub. I think it's about eight months ago, if LinkedIn is correct. Um, and so today, we're going to talk about how you came in. There was a big inflated number around SQLs and um, you came in and reworked that process to help get that into a more manageable uh, cost per, per acquisition. So before we jump into the numbers and the data, one thing that's really interesting about the setup that you have is your team structure. So mm -hmm. being in demand gen, you have the SDRs report to you. Can you walk us through that process and the thought process behind getting to that point and why the SDRs are with you versus sales? Yeah. So, I mean, they originally sat under sales and the way our company is structured is the CRO kind of eats the go-to-market side. So it's all go-to-market under CRO. And so the SDRs reported into the CRO. I reported into the CRO. Everyone was reporting into him. And so it was very flat like that. And increasingly we began to see that like that doesn't make a huge amount of sense because people were very siloed and sort of not able to deliver what you would want out of teams. Like teams weren't working in tandem to get to the goals. And so when I joined, I, the SDRs did not report to me. It wasn't part of my like job description. Um, but I came in and immediately kind of started digging at like, okay, how many campaigns have you run? And like, what was the cost of each of these campaigns? And when did you win back money? And all of the really obvious, I think, DG questions you come in with and nobody could answer them. And so increasingly, as I started digging and digging and digging, it just became evident that like these, te these teams work so closely together that everything at the demand team team does like everything we do as a team is to support the SDR team. Everything we do is based on the assumption that there are good leads leading to the SDR team to get to the sales team. And so it just made increasing sense for them to sit under me. And so when we re reorged that and moved it under me, we were able to make huge changes in the way we did things because I was able to attend even just simple stuff. Like I could go to stand up and listen to how my leads were doing every day. Whereas before we would send the list and it would kind of be forgotten. And now I could go in and really dig and be like, okay, well, did you work these leads? Like what happened with them? Were they good leads? Like particularly from webinars and things like that. I could be like, okay, did you work those leads? What did you think of them? And the SDRs would give me feedback and I could be like, okay, we shouldn't do that anymore. Or yeah, okay, this is, we're getting somewhere. And one of the things that I found is that we had a lot of out of control campaigns is what I called them. Like people just doing kind of whatever they wanted with like very not best practices at all and nobody really looking at the metrics. And so as I got better at kind of delineating, okay, this is what I think is important and this is my lever points and this is where I'm checking in daily to make sure things are running. I could use the SDRs as a point in that kind of big funnel to say, hey, this is working, this isn't, before I was getting the data back because our sales cycle was so long. So it was a really good way to kind of optimize how we thought about things and how we built the team out. And so as I brought in content, our content team was then able to support the, the SDR team versus just demand gen. And like when they wrote nurture, the nurtures kind of work in tandem now with the outbound they do. So it's a really like, co I don't know what the word is, but good alignment. relationship. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And one of the other aspects of that and like in being able to drive alignment. And I think you highlighted this. And when you first joined, there was a really inflated costs around like the sales qualified lead. Right. And so I think, and that alignment is, was naturally driven just based out of necessity to have that be a more manageable number. Uh, is that a fair? Yeah. I mean, I can go into, so when I joined, I don't think I can give the exact numbers, but the goal was probably like 20 X what we would want our SQL cost per SQL to be. And the reason for that is that the people driving the advertising weren't in any way related to the SDR or sales team. They were looking at new users, net new users and net new users to us meant organic traffic. It meant people that we have a free product. So people that sign up for the free product were coming from paid advertising in vast numbers. And then, you know, they disappear into the abyss because they weren't qualified leads. And so that gap in understanding that like, the more time you you put between someone signing up for your product or you getting a name or a lead and the longer it takes the SDR to work it, the more likely you are to see 
higher costs, right? Because you're dragging the process out, you have a lot of friction points. And so what we did is like sort of obvious, I think, but it was important is we like just immediately, anything that was paid now points only at the sales team, right? So we are able to, to just like take out the rest of that funnel. And then when you put them there, we could then control the cost a lot easier because we could see what keywords were driving SQLs. Um, whereas before for advertising and particularly SEM, they couldn't really attribute that because all the keywords drove free signups, of course. <laughs> and then once you get into the free product, it's really hard for us. And in that, sorry, to back up a little bit, like our SDR team was sort of drowning in leads because they had all these free people that were coming in, but not very qualified. And so one of the like big initiatives on top of fixing advertising I did and like pulling the cost down 22%, I think. I can just say it's, it's dramatically lower. It's at a reasonable goal now. Um, is that they are now able to take the leads that they get and we're able to filter them into a way where they get, instead of getting 2000 leads a month that were like from India and made no sense, they now get 400 leads a month that are qualified based on the nurtures that the demand gen team is doing. And so all of that sounds really simple, but actually what I've learned in this whole process is like your marketing ops and the tools you use to support all of this are critical and like how you build that out and how you think about the different points of like where it becomes important is how you support an SDR team, you support a sales team and you grow a pipeline. And so what we've kind of spent most of our, what I've spent eight months doing basically is redoing Marketo and setting up really advanced lead scoring that is able to tell people like, okay, this person did this, this person did this and this. And we now know that they're building a product and to complicate things for us, we're not a simple SaaS product. Like a lot of people where it's like, you know, if you were buying, I'm trying to think of a good example, Salesforce even, it's just like, oh, I have a sales team, I need Salesforce, right? For us, it's more complicated. You have to actually be building something because we're a developer product. So you have to have the need for the product. We can't just like go outbound to you and hope for the best. Um, and so what we're now able to do is use both demographic and behavioral information to feed that into the SDR team. And they're not just getting pinged like, hey, you have a lead, but they're getting pinged with all that enhanced information on our website, which is like fairly complex because it's an old company of like, which blogs did they visit? What document pages have they looked at? What are they likely building? Um, what industries are they interested in? Because you can't always tell that for us um, just mm -hmm. off of a website because it's not so simple. Like you might be in healthcare, but you might be using us for a device and it's like a little, it, that's a complex PubNub problem, but um, it has enhanced the way that we're able to think about leads and then funnel them through to the sales team. And like looking at all those important points of like, for me, what I started with is like, okay, like how many leads are there? What's the cost for an MQL? What's the cost for an SQL? What's the conversion rate from MQL to SQL? Okay, and then what's the conversion rate from, and our SQL is like kind of like a sales accepted lead. Okay. And then what's the conversion rate from there to accepted by the AE team, which we call accepted SQL. And so those are like my friction points. And then I also went on like, want to, you know, close the gap. And so I'm like, all right. And then from accepted SQL, what's my likelihood to close? And what's the timeline around that? And when will I win back my advertising money or the money I put in to self-service or whatever I'm enhancing um, with nurtures from my staff so that I can clearly show ROI to the CFO and no one's going to pull my budget. Um, which you see a lot in marketing where they're just like, I don't know what you're doing. <laughs> Goodbye. And just to, I guess, clarify there, Julia. So are you still running, are people still signing up for the product organically? You're just not using that as a paid source and back to that. Yeah, we do still use it. Um, so they, so we have now our, we've defined channels now. So we have three main channels, many others. We have paid, which is like paid social and um, paid, uh, search, sorry, I'm like, what is it called? SEM. And then the, we have organic, which drives a vast majority of our traffic. We have a, previous to me joining, we had built out a pretty extensive website with like a lot of content around developer uses and stuff. So we're driving a lot of traffic through that. And then our final channel is probably outbound SDR and the SDR team. So those are our three main buckets for like where we pick up leads and the only thing i changed is i didn't take away the self-service free product i just tapered down the amount and made sure that the people that were past the sales team were somewhat qualified because we ran into the secondary problem which a lot of people probably see now is like as we move increasingly in the sdr world to like the mass email scale thing where you just like outreach 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 you run it and especially with all these data tools you run into bounce issues right mm. you don't have your leads 
your, your domain protected and you're going to do better if you use your own domain. And so by taking all of the bad leads out and making sure we had qualified email addresses and the right company and they fit certain behavioral characteristics, we now are not being blacklisted by Gmail saying like, eh, you're in trouble. We're not getting spam blocked. <laughs> like we don't deal with that anymore, which was a big problem with us. Um, and I've seen it at a lot of companies that use, you know, data enhancement prospecting software um, because, you know, especially, to, I, it just depends on what industry you're in, but particularly I was came from the sales industry, like sales enablement and like salespeople turn over at a phenomenal rate. And so your database is just bad. Like you just can't get good email addresses. And so having ways to kind of filter that um, without just relying on Neverbounce or some of the tools that do that actually is more productive, I think, because it's happening automatically without you having to cleanse your database on a regular basis. Um, so that's kind of how we've gone about it. You know, there are like in any product, there are some boo-boos, I think, that are built into the product. Like we don't authenticate our email addresses. So that's a place that we could probably fix, but okay. now marketing does that automatically. And we set up our whole Marketo to kind of like at the, it, when I came in, Marketo was like all the email addresses. Like even if you were outreaching, like everything sat in Marketo and like, that's kind of not best practices. So now anyone that hasn't agreed to be contacted by us and is following GDPR and, you know, the big new protocols that we have doesn't sit in the Marketo database or it sits there, but it's in a different group where we know not to email them and they are completely insulated from getting bad emails from us. And so for us, that's been a big change and a really actually effective one. And sometimes I know like on people in marketing always are looking for like the next great thing. And like some of the people that report to me have been like, oh, Sendoso saw 35X engagement from this campaign and like, I think at the end of the day, like successful marketing actually begins with like one, the idea that like you are just a bitch to the sales team. Like your job is to like make the sales team look good and however you need to do that, that's what you do in marketing. And then the other part of it is like, you are an ROI driver, which means you always need to be cognizant of how much your team is spending, what you're producing and how that impacts the bigger picture. And if you can take all the bullshit out of kind of what we do and just look at that you can i found it's really easy to focus on like the things that matter and the things that drive value for companies absolutely and so i guess when you when you start to think that way and we start to look at like the conversion rates and what have happened since implementing that more uh, i guess stringent process right and being very uh, very strict on the leads that you accept what was the impact on the conversion rate uh, that you saw when you went from cutting what, whether it was, let's say thousands of leads down to hundreds. Um, and then alternatively, how did that progress through, right? Was there a, yeah. a trickle down effect and did it? Yeah. So my work? cost, it began with like the cost per an SQL dropped, you know, I'm not, I don't want, I know I was told by my legal team not to say this stuff, so I'm going to be careful, but it was astronomical. Mm -hmm. um, it was more than a sale almost. And it's down now to like a very reasonable number that we can sustain for an eternity. And it's continues to be like that. So that's one like big thing. The second part we saw, um, and I'm probably misphrasing your questions wrong was what did that do to pipeline? So after you were able to like get that under control, I then can start predicting pipeline. Mm -hmm. And so over time, I've seen a, exactly 48% increase in our pipeline in revenue wow. actually driven from what we do. And, and to me that speaks, you know, like COVID probably, it's, it, there's a million things that you can attribute it to, but I think process is the number one thing that matters and having it right and making sure that our, our team wasn't drowning in bad leads and wasting their time on things that they shouldn't be mm -hmm. is probably what has resulted in the biggest impact because big, big accounts come in all the time for us. We, we deal with enterprise, but before, if you, we do, uh, I don't know about a lot of companies, but we have Chili Piper, which is essentially like a Calendly type thing that automates their schedules. Um, if they're drowning in Calendly links, they don't have time to take the call from the big guy who just popped in right. um, and they have to push it out. And like, then they're trying to schedule these shitty maybe deals with the AEs and we have an SA team too. So you've got a lot of people you're trying to coordinate. And so when you're able to take that out and only push through quality leads and get the conversion rate up. So, you know, our conversion rate was at like 2% from all leads um, for all channels. 
And now it's closer to like 10%, I think, across the board. But then if you wow. take out advertising, it's closer to 20%. If you take out different channels, like you're looking at a much better conversion rate from lead all the way through. Um, so I, I feel really positive. <laughs> yeah, no, that's awesome. That is incredible, right? And you, just in itself right there, like five times increase in the number of people that are converting through the funnel uh, with higher quality and I'm sure that that has uh, effects across uh, sales velocity uh, and all of that and how fast people are moving through the pipeline um, as yeah, well. Yeah, and I mean, I don't want to over like sell myself. Like at the end of the day, I'm part of a bigger team doing a lot of stuff. Like there's a ma massively important people at my company who have helped make this stuff possible. It wasn't just me. Um, and also the team that supports me is, is done a ton of work, but I think what has changed is that everyone is, even though we're still making mistakes, like we're a startup and we make mistakes all the time, is every time we do it, we get closer to knowing our, I keep calling, I love that like quadrant thing where it's like your known knowns, your unknown knowns and like known unknowns. We know more and more our unknown unknowns and mm. that makes life so much easier because then it's like, oh, instead of just speculating like, oh, the website broke, so tracking's down and everyone's like, where is it broken? And nobody can figure out what's going on. We now are able to be like, like for example, we had a, a lead scoring issue where emails weren't going out. And in history of PubNub, that would have been like a month long fiasco where we'd all been like, I don't know, like, where is it coming from? And we were able to, within a week, just be like, oh, you know, they're stuck in lead limbo and Marketo. And like, we just have to fix this smart list and the problem solved. And that to me is like where you see big differences because you're not wasting time on fire drills. You're like right. slowly making progress every week towards a goal. And so I think that's probably like, and when I talk to a lot of, a lot of my friends are in marketing as I'm sure <laughs> all marketers love marketers. Um, to me, like the biggest difference I see in all companies is like marketing is always a shit show, right? Like it's just, it just is like this afterthought always. And so the being strategic about how you drive ROI is like what differentiates companies that are like a total shit show that you like can't even get marketing under control. And then ones that like actually drive value because eventually the CFOs and the CEOs will come sniffing around and be like, why'd you buy a billboard? <laughs> Like it always happens. It's just a matter of time. Um, and so if you have hard numbers and you track that stuff and you, you have your ops really tight, um, you can get away with doing things like buying billboards because you can at least attribute, you know, this direct unknown traffic to it. Um, and I have, I tell my team all the time, and it's like one of my favorite marketing lines is like, we're not in Mad Men anymore. This is big data. Like, I don't care what you think. Just tell me what the numbers tell you. Um, and so that's how I operate demand gen. And like, I know this isn't, you guys look for concrete campaigns and like, I don't really have one to tell you except that we cleaned up our SEM by making, you know, gated landing pages. And we went after the right keywords <laughs> and eliminated ones that didn't have return. But I think having the ops behind that is how you get there and like right. setting up the tracking, worrying about that stuff is what will deliver impact and what has delivered impact at our company. That's awesome. Well, Julia, I really appreciate you coming on and sharing um, how you're able to clean it up and build that process around at PubNub. Uh, if people want to connect with you and, and learn more either about yourself or about PubNub, what's the best way to connect? Um, well, you can find us on pubnub.com if you're building anything with chat. Um, we are an incredible resource for that. I just, I'll plug PubNub for two seconds. PubNub is a place where you can power device to device communication and that can take a million forms. Um, this isn't like a approved marketing speak. This is my speak about it. But to me, what we do is power amazing customers to do really incredible things. And so you look at companies like Peloton, everything on that scoreboard besides the video on that screen you see is powered by PubNub. Um, and so there's so many iterations that can take, like we power a church, um, an online church service where they power, we power the chat for them. And if you think about like in the world of COVID, what we do, like I just think it's the most incredible thing, customizable chat where you can have like a million people in, 30 million people in or one person, like it is kind of the future. And so check it out, pubnub.com. And I'm all over LinkedIn. <laughs> I'm, I'm a marketer. I'm a glutton for self, self uh, whatever you want to say, aggrandizing. 
Cool. So you'll find me there. <laughs> Perfect. So pubnob.com. Pubnob.com. Pub pub and then and you be. <laughs> exactly. And then LinkedIn. Awesome, mm -hmm. Julia. Well, I really appreciate it and hope Thank you have a great you so weekend. Much. You too. I hope you enjoyed another unfluffy episode of the Show Me the Data podcast. If you want to become part of our community with other demand gen leaders and get exclusive access to Q&As with the guests we have on the show, click the link in the description of the podcast.